as the offering is being uh, collected, your tithes and your offering, I uh, just want to mention a couple things. My dad was wondering if this prayer movement is going to continue. It's going to continue all the way up to our Easter outreach. So you're going to be getting texts and uh, notifications for the next uh, four weeks. That's what the Lord wanted us to do. And uh, if you have not got a text or maybe you're not receiving the notifications, it's because you don't have our church app or you don't have your notifications turned on. Uh, we want everyone in here to be a part. So because of that, if you would reach in your pocket and pull out your cell phone and show it to me, everybody in here, let me see your cell phone. I want you to go in there and I want you either to set an alarm for 8 p.m. or a reminder for 8 p.m. that's calling you to prayer. Because this is a prayer movement in this entire church and we're praying and bathing our Easter outreach in prayer. You know 2 Chronicles 7.14 says, if my people pray, then I will do these things. And we said last week as we talked about the passport of prayer, we can set up in a great evangelistic service, but we know from scripture as 120 gathered in an upper room to pray and the Holy Spirit fell upon them, immediately 3,000 people asked, how could I get saved and came into the kingdom? So we know that prayer is what moves the hand of God. We want to bathe our outreach, our efforts in prayer. Amen. Somebody say amen to that. Today I want to talk to you with a message called Prophetic Edge. As you know, we just had all of our, not all of our, some of our prophetic people come up here and prophesy over different people in this company, in this tribe of believers here. And we are raising up a prophetic house. In fact, when I moved here, I heard the word of the Lord come to me and God said that this was going to be an eagle's nest where people come to find out who they really are. And I didn't understand that at the time. That's a word given to me 17 years ago. And in that context, we're starting to raise up a prophetic culture here. We're starting to raise up a house of the prophetic. And it's important. And that's what I want to show you in today's message, that God has designed his people to have a prophetic edge. Everybody say prophetic edge. Before we jump, in fact, I'm going to go ahead and read to you Joel chapter 2, verse 28. Jesus also quoted this, and it said, It shall come to pass in the last days that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. Your sons and daughters shall... We all want the Holy Spirit to be poured out. That's one of the hallmarks of this company of believers. As we are a presence-driven church, we long for the pouring out of His Holy Spirit on a continual basis. If that's the case, your sons and daughters shall prophesy. God is raising up a prophetic generation in this hour because there are too many people out in the community who are walking around. They don't know who they are. They are discouraged. They are hopeless. They don't know where to turn and what to do. And it's the word of the Lord that comes to someone and lifts them up and transforms their life. Whenever God speaks, things happen. Let there be light and light came from the dark. Amen? Because you're here today, it's because God spoke to you. God spoke to you. He called you to being. That's why you are here. So this is a company of believers who believes in the prophetic. And my message title today is called Prophetic Edge. I know this is not in your notes, but this is... uh, The scripture that kind of started to spur this word in me. If you want to, you can turn to 2 Kings chapter 6. In 2 Kings chapter 6, there was an army, the Arameans, who came against the Israelites. And every time they came to attack the God's people, the Israelites, they were thwarted at every move. If they wanted to attack up north, all of a sudden the armies of Israel would be already positioned there to beat them back. And they were like, what is going on? And the king of the Arameans, the enemy king, got so angry that he called his generals in and he says, we got a traitor in our midst. We need to root him out. We need to find out who's giving our information. And 
one of them sheepishly, one of the generals sheepishly said, King, um, that's not what's going on here. There's no traitor in our midst. There's a prophet in their midst. And the prophet hears all of your strategies and he tells the king of Israel all what's about to take place. And he's like, you're kidding me. What's going on? In fact, so he sends out, a, he raises a war party and says, someone needs to go find that prophet Elisha and take him out or seize him or jail him because all of our efforts are not fruitful because there is a prophet in their midst. I need you to realize this morning that the word of the Lord over us this morning is to make room for the prophetic. To make room in our lives. A lot of people think that when we embrace the Holy Spirit in its fullness, when we embrace the gifts, we become A, either mystical, B, weird, or C, not uh, palatable to the things of the, or the people of this world. And it's just not true. It's a lie of the enemy. The more we embrace the prophetic, the more we have a prophetic edge, which means to overcome. So I want to talk a little bit about that this morning. And the verse, the main text that God has given me to share with you has gripped me all week like I haven't been gripped in a long time, which probably means my sermon is going to clunk because that means he's still working it out in me. But I know what I'm feeling and I know what I hear. So some of you out there, you need to be praying for me right now that I would represent the heart of the Lord on this matter. But I want you to look, and we're going we're gonna to bounce off of this scripture, because I just really feel the Holy Spirit wanting to drive this message, prophetic edge, home. 1 Timothy 1.18. Timothy, my son, here are my instructions for you. Based on the prophetic words spoken about you earlier, may they help you fight well in the Lord's battles. Let me read that one more time. Timothy, my son, here are my instructions for you based on the prophetic words spoken about you earlier. May they help you fight well in the Lord's battles. Will you bow in prayer with me? Father, as I unpack this verse, May your heart be represented. May your anointing rest upon me and upon the ears and hearts of all your people. You said in your word, let us, he who has ears, let him hear what the Spirit is speaking to the church. Let our ears be open and we stand on the promise that you said, my sheep will know my voice. So God, I pray that we would take heart of this message from your word this morning. And all God's people said, amen. My first point that I want to make this morning is prophetic words are to be spoken, not silenced. We live in a day and age where most churches say, you know what, we want all that weird stuff pushed to the side or out the back door. We don't want to talk about the Holy Spirit. In fact, my dad and I can tell you, we've even had a few people leave this church because they talk about the Holy Spirit too much. I mean, really. He's fully God, Holy Spirit. He's part of the Trinity. You know, talk about God too much there. I'm telling you right now, we're in an age in our uh, streams in the Western church where people, they have a theology, a, a knowledge about God, but they don't really embrace his fullness and his power. And I'm here to tell you today that it's our relationship with the Holy Spirit and his power and his gifts flowing through us that give us an edge. There's a reason why the Church of America is in decline today. It's because we're trying to operate in our own strength. And many churches, and I'm, I'm not pointing a finger at any other church or whatever, but many churches have reduced their time with God down to a one-hour service of self-help in the morning. And I'm here to tell you it's the power of God that transforms lives. And we need to embrace the fullness if we want to see God's fullness come. So we're, prophetic words are to be spoken, not silenced. We know Proverbs 18.21 says, The tongue can bring life or death. 
In fact, it goes on to say, those who love to talk will reap its consequences. And people look at that as a negative. Oh, your mouth is writing checks that you can't cash. And I'm here to tell you that in the Christian world, in the kingdom, we do write checks that our mouths speak out. We call things into being. That's how, we, when we have a relationship with God, he reveals his heart to us and we can embrace what he is speaking. Jesus himself said, I only speak what I hear my father speaking. We are to be a church that speaks. And when we hear a prophetic or the prophetic word, we often think of prediction of future events or or fortune telling, or predicting the outcome of a football game, or maybe I can kind of link in and get the lotto numbers for this week. And, and it's all kind of this mystical thing for us. As we look at the Old Testament, we see that the prophets acted as God's mouthpiece for speaking his message to kings and, and, and shaping nations. And we're like, man, that seems so foreign to me. In the New Testament, God has taken this prophetic gift and he has revolutionized it. He has, I believe, upgraded it. In the New Testament church, the gift of prophecy means to speak forth and proclaim. In other words, prophetic words contain foretelling, which means to know the future. There is an aspect uh, prophetic of, of knowing the future, but it also means Forth telling. Everybody say forth telling. It means to cause the future to happen. Wow. Because if we're linking into the heartbeat of God and he is speaking to us and we are speaking the things that God is speaking, he always speaks before he acts. And so when we become speakers of God's word, things transform in our lives. Things transform around us. We are to be people who speak. God never meant for his church just to attend. He meant for us to speak. So prophetic words do not just call out the future in one's life. They have the ability to transform the person into who they were always meant to be. Let me give you an example of this. Many of you know our friends up in Bethel Reading, and, and uh, Chris Vallotton is one of the senior leaders there. But he was sitting across at a table with a couple that was dear to them, friends of theirs. And this couple had had many, many uh, miscarriages and couldn't have children. So they had the disappointment they were carrying of getting pregnant, being excited, miscarriage, 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 and so disappointing. Well, they were just out to dinner, and, and Chris Vallotton is a, a prophet, and he's sitting there, and all of a sudden he hears the whisper of the Lord, and the whisper of the Lord says, tell them by, this, by nine months from today, or whatever the case is this year, she is going to get pregnant and have a child. And he was like, in, in one sense, he was like, yes! But then all of a sudden he was like, oh, because if I tell them this and it doesn't happen, they're going to be crushed. And there was great responsibility, and he felt the heaviness of it, and he's like, I'm not going to tell them that. No way am I going to crush their spirit. And the Holy Spirit said this to him, if you don't speak it, it's not going to happen. In the tongue is life and death. We are called to speak things into existence. So like I teach our prophetic team, and those, there's over 40 of you that were trained in our prophetic class three semesters ago, I, you know, we come with humility, saying we prophesy in part. We may not totally understand, and we come in humility, and we say, I think the Lord is saying this. You need to pray into it. You need to judge every word, all of those kind of things. But in humility, we're like, but this is what I feel God is speaking to you. And sure enough, within a year, she was pregnant and they had a child. There is great responsibility in stewarding the word of the Lord through our lives. But we cannot be a silent community. 
We have to be people who are speaking what we hear the Father speaking. The prophetic edge in our life, it's, you know, church growth and revival and the fullness of the Spirit isn't going to come through better ideas, better leadership, better creativity, all of those kind of things. We need all of that, but it's going to come through the fullness of the power of God. Some trust in horses and chariots, but others trust in the in the Lord. It's always been through him and him moving through us. So really quickly in your notes, I'm just going to pound through this to get through the, uh, to the heart of this message. Prophetic words simply reveal Jesus to us. Reveal. A lot of people are like, why do we care so much about the prophetic? Well, Jesus is revealed to us. Ephesians 1.17, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give to you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him. He is revealing himself to us. Revelation 19.10, worship God for the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. Wow. What is, you might be scratching your head. What does that verse even mean? Well, I believe it has a threefold meaning. It means all true prophecy is inspired by Holy Spirit. The purpose of prophecy is always to bear witness to Jesus. And that the Holy Spirit is chiefly characterized by prophetic manifestations. What I'm trying to tell you is prophecy is all about knowing Jesus' heart towards us. It's about realizing that he is for me and not against me. It's about realizing that he has thoughts about me, about how, man, if he is truly the creator, which he is, he created me. When he created me, he created me in, with, with a purpose in mind. And so I, if I want to know my purpose, if I want to know God's plan for my life, I need to link in to the God of the plan. And he's speaking. And the more he speaks, his plan for my life and for this church and the community is revealed. His heart is revealed through his gifts. Secondly, prophetic words build up the church. Everybody say build. They build up the church. 1 Timothy 1.18, our text here, says, My son, here are my instructions for you. And what are they based on? They're based on the prophetic words spoken about you earlier. 1 Corinthians 12, 31, the manifestation of the Spirit is given to each one for the profit of all. Earnestly desire the best gifts. So what it's saying is that the Holy Spirit is moving through gifts for your benefit. We are not prophesying for His benefit, we're prophesying for yours. 1 Corinthians 14, 31 says, For you can all prophesy one by one that all may learn and be encouraged. Did you get that? We may all prophesy so that all may learn and be encouraged. When we embrace a prophetic culture in our church, we position ourselves for heavenly strategy and exponential growth. That you may learn and grow up into the things of God. When you push away the gifts of the Spirit, when you push away the manifestations of the Holy Spirit, when we don't have room in our lives for the prophetic, all you do is regurgitate what you know. And you never rise up into the fullness of what God has for you. There is fresh, fresh instruction waiting for you in your walk with him as you lean into his heart and hear what he is speaking over you. Amen. It's for the building up of the church. Thirdly, prophetic words encourage people. Encourage. 1 Corinthians 14.3 he who prophesies speaks edification and exhortation and encouragement. So that's what I call when I'm teaching in the prophetic the three E's. Encourage, edify, and exhort. It's not to prophesy and say, oh, the Lord is about to get you. He is so angry with San Francisco, he's about to wipe them off the face of the earth. All of that is junk because the scripture tells us in the New Testament that all prophecy is to encourage edify and exhort. Edification means to build up, promoting growth. 
Exhortation means to compel to action. Encourage means to inspire with courage, spirit, and confidence. We release words just like when the words were being released today. We're saying God is with you in the things that are coming. Do not have fear. Rise up. Partner with him and step into the fullness. A lot of times with all that's going on in this world, we can see the swirling, we can see what the dysfunction in the nation and around us and the people we work with and on and on. And we can get blinded by the wind and the waves when in actuality, what gives us the courage to press through to the promises of God is the words that he has spoken because faith comes by... So encourage, edify, exhort. That's why prophetic words always call out the gold and not the trash. Amen. Prophetic words focus on the treasure, not the trash. Everybody knows where you failed. Everyone knows how you've, you're discouraged. You don't have to hide those things. I mean, what we do is so... We work so hard to hide all of our failures. And, but the problem is we can see our failures. We can see our weaknesses. But a few of us... Few of us see the greatness that God has put in you. Few of us, because of all the failures that mask all of that, we look at ourselves in our fallen nature and we're like, woe is me. I'm just a grasshopper. I'm just a worm. And we walk around acting like a worm because we think we are. But God has said, behold, you are a new creation. The old is gone and the new has come. You are now a butterfly to soar on the wings of the wind, the spirit. But many butterflies are out there crawling around in the trash because all you see is the trash. And so the beauty of the prophetic, the beauty of hearing God's heart and what he's speaking in this hour is you get to look at someone and say, I don't see trash, I see treasure. I get to call out the gold. Yes, sir. I get to call out the beauty. I get to point out the beauty. There is a real enemy, Satan, out there who's the accuser of the brethren. He's the accuser of the church. And he's like, let me tell you what he's done. A, B, C, D, and E. But there's a real God out there who is speaking something entirely different over your life. When he thought you into being, when he spoke you into being, it was with a purpose and a plan. He says, for I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans to prosper you, not to harm you, to give you hope in a future, to rise up and to be mighty and significant in this day. Most of us, oh, man, but pastor, you don't know what I did last night. But you don't know what God's about to do in and through your life. Hallelujah. What he has purposed to do. And the prophetic, that's why I said this is going to be an eagle's nest where people come to find their real identity. Because there's so many people out in the community living what they think is their real identity. But it's a, it's a counterfeit of what they were created to be. Living in weakness, living in discouragement, living in lack and brokenness. And the Lord is saying, oh, but I created you for so much more. Oh, that the prophets would speak. Oh, we need to be a church that speaks. 1 Corinthians 14, 24 and 25. But if all prophesy and an unbeliever, everybody say unbeliever. If all prophesy and an unbeliever or uninformed person comes in to the assembly, he is convinced, brought to light, exposed by all. He is convicted by all. Convicted doesn't mean condemnation. Doesn't mean you're a loser. Let me tell you and pull your card. I know what you were doing. He is convicted. How do we know this? Because it says the secrets of his heart are revealed. And so falling down on his face, he will worship God and report that God is truly among you. So what's happening is when we embrace the prophetic, those who are coming in who don't know him or are uninformed are going to say, whoa, God is here. Secondly, it says that they're not going to fall down in shame. They're going to lift up their hands in worship from their knees because somebody has called out the treasure in their lives when all they see is worthlessness. This is the real deal we're talking about here. 
This verse shows us that prophecy reveals the secrets of an unbeliever's heart. It's not exposing the trash secrets. It's exposing the treasure that God wants to do something significant in your life. And the fact that you are here listening to this message, I'm talking to you, that God wants to do something significant through your life in this church, in this valley. Prophetic words bring people into a revelation of the glory that God has assigned to them. What does the scripture say? For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory. When Jesus Christ came and died on the cross and was resurrected, he restored all that was stolen. What was stolen? The glory. We've fallen short of the glory. God wants his glory to be seen through your life. God wants you walking in the glory, demonstrating the glory, letting people out in the marketplace see the glory of the Lord upon you. And they're going to be like, something's different with him or her. I want what they got. Prophetic words bring people into that revelation, into that understanding. Some of you sit back and say, well, that sounds like pride, that God wants to raise you up. I'm telling you, God gets no glory when you're walking around like a worm. God gets no glory when you're wallowing in your sin. God gets no glory when you're sitting on your hands. God gets no glory when you close your mouth. God gets no glory when you're not out there advancing the kingdom. Number two, prophetic words are to be used. Ah, this is where he has just gripped me this whole week. So the instruction came based on the prophetic words that were spoken in Timothy's life. But then he said, and this, whole, this phrase right here has gripped me all week. May they help you fight well in the Lord's battles. May they help you fight well in the Lord's battles. And then I heard the Holy Spirit speak to me. He said, Regan, some are warring with the prophetic. And with the prophetic, some are warring. Some are warring with the prophetic. And with the prophetic, some are warring. In your notes, some are warring with the prophetic. And I want you to write this in the blank. They are ignorant. Ignorant. 1 Corinthians 12, 1. Now concerning spiritual gifts, brethren, I do not want you to be ignorant. This word ignorant in the Greek is agnaeo. Agnaeo it means to be ignorant, to not know, to be wrong, to ignore. 1 Thessalonians 5.20 says, do not despise prophecies. Do you want to know why that's written in there? Because it's easy to despise them. And there are, even in our company of believers, there are people like, I don't have room for that. That's for Pastor Regan and his minions. I'm like, What? Last time I checked, that's for the building up and the edification of the church. And it even says if an unbeliever comes in, that's how they're going to know that God is in their midst. Ignorance. Oh, it's Prophetic Sunday. I'm not going. That's where they get weird. Oh, there's a prophet coming from Detroit, Annie Byrne, in two weeks. I'm making sure I'm working that day. Ignorance. Oh, that is for someone else. Oh, that's for those who prophesy. I'm not that one. Scripture just said for you can all prophesy. Speaking out. See, it comes out of relationship with God. I hear his heartbeat, what he's speaking to the church. I, I'm tapped into him with intimacy. Out of my prayer language, out of my prayer time. Prayer is relationship and communication and connection with God. Giving me access to all of his secrets. And he speaks those secrets and then we get to reveal them. Do not despise prophecies. This word despise is exuthaneo, and it means to make no account, to treat with contempt, even to mock. Oh, here they go again. Listen to all the flowery speech that they have to say over people. 
It's the same word used in Luke 23, 11, when Herod and his goons put a robe on Jesus and said, oh, aren't you the king of the Jews? They put the robe on him and they begin to mock him. This is the exact same word that he is using. Do not despise prophecy is the same word they used for those who clothed Jesus and mocked him. In the church, we're not to despise prophecy. We're supposed to treasure prophecy. Let me give you an example of what this looks like. In Luke chapter 2, verse 19, it said, But Mary treasured up all these things and pondered them in her heart. What was she treasuring? Well, the angel of the Lord appeared to her and said, Listen, this is what God has intended to do with your life. The Holy Spirit is going to overshadow you and you're going to give birth to the Son. In fact, it's not just going to be a Son. It's going to be the Son of God and you shall call him Jesus. Prophesying, speaking about what he heard God speak. The angel heard what God spoke and he told her what God was about to do. And it didn't say she despised it. It says she treasured these things. She pondered them. I want to tell you, don't despise prophecy. Desire prophecy. Don't push it away. Ponder it. Treasure it in your heart. Remember, everything we receive from God is by faith. Faith comes by hearing. So if we're hearing what God is speaking, we take hold of those things. And even though everything that I see tells me what I heard isn't true, I hold on to those promises. I treasure them. I ponder them. In that moment, Mary didn't look down and see a big stomach. At least I don't think she was heavy, probably. But she didn't see a baby in her. But she treasured the word of the Lord that had been spoken over life. God is speaking over each one of us every single week. He is prophesying over each one of you every single week. I wonder if we truly treasure those promises. I wonder if we ponder those promises. I wonder if we partner with those promises like Mary shows us. First Corinthians 14, 1 Corinthians 14.1 says, Pursue love and desire spiritual gifts, but especially, especially, everybody say especially. especially, but especially that you may what? Prophesy. God wants us to desire prophecy, to be zealous for, to pursue eagerly, to pursue it intensely. In fact, the scripture goes so far, if you look into the Greek, it says even so to lust after it, so desire it deep down, so zealous for the word of God. I remember a prophet pulling me out and speaking over my life, and he said, Regan, God says that you are zealous for his word. And I'm like, what? What does that mean? It means I'm hungry for the now word. I'm hungry for his word. I'm hungry for what he's speaking. God wants us to make room for prophecy. In 2 Kings chapter 4, there was this woman and this man, and they realized that there was a prophet. And you heard Stephen Walker, who when he's up here referenced this verse, he said, if you embrace a prophet, then you get a prophet's reward. You get the gift of him in your life. But the connotation is if you reject him, you get nothing. Well, there was a woman in 2 Kings chapter 4, and she realized that there was this prophet named Elisha who kept walking back and forth by her property and coming in and out of her life. And she said, you know what? I need to make room for him. And so she talked to her husband and convinced him to build a, a room for the prophet that whenever he would come by, he had a place to stay. They put a bed, a table, a chair, a light so that he could study all of that where they could feed him and he could house. They made room for the prophetic. And do you know what happened to that household? The supernatural was, was released in her midst. Transformation, revival. I wonder, the Holy Spirit is speaking over you. Is there room in your life for the prophet? Is there room in your life for the prophetic to move? Some are warring with the prophetic. 
letter B, but with the prophetic, some are warring. And I want you to write this in. They are victorious. They are victorious. Look at our main text again, 1 Timothy 1.18. Timothy, my son, here are my instructions for you based on the prophetic words spoken about you earlier. May they help you fight well in the Lord's battles. May they help you fight well in the Lord's battles. I believe the reason why so many are discouraged and are falling out of relationship with God, falling in times of spiritual warfare, is because they don't embrace the prophetic move of God in their life. The reason why so many get discouraged in the battle is because they don't have a now word to hold on to. They're not anchored in the promise of the Lord. I tell you right now, whether it's my dad who has heard the word of the Lord say to build this project, to get ready for the great revival that is coming, the billion soul harvest, and we're in this. If he didn't get a now word once in a while, I remember even the Lord sending me and a friend to a conference in Reading one time years ago, and I didn't understand it. I was like, why am I going? I guess I'm just going for my friend. I don't even like that drive, six and a half hours. The conference looked good, but it wasn't something that I would say I got to be at, but we went up there. And, and at that conference, Joseph Garlington, Bishop Joseph Garlington was speaking, and he spoke all of these words on building on encouragement, on hanging in when it's tough, and all of these things. And as he spoke, everything he taught on that whole weekend, I knew it was for all for my dad. I bought this CD set, brought it home to him, gave it to him, and he's literally worn that series out, haven't you? And he, when there's times of discouragement in his life, to keep him fighting the good fight in the Lord's battles, he has to pull out that now word. He's got to pull out those words that God is speaking in the moment because there's a real enemy who is hell-bent on discouraging you. And let me tell you, the enemy doesn't fight you over where you are. He's always fighting you over where he's, God is taking you. Amen. So he's, when you're feeling discouragement and fear and, and travail in your life, it's because the enemy realizes there's a great promise over you. Amen. And it's in those moments of discouragement he's raising up just hell in your life you need to be linked to a promise this word war war a good warfare and the king james says war a good warfare is stratuo which means to make military expedition to lead soldiers to war or battle to be active in service to fight to execute the apostolate to execute the commissioning to execute the going to execute the battle to what he's called you to to contend with the carnal inclinations which tell you you cannot do it you will not overcome everything in front of you says no 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 but what you heard was yes 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 I need to hold on to that prophetic word because it helps me war it helps me fight well Closing this up, if you're wondering. Matthew 4.4 4 says, But Jesus told them, No, the scriptures say, People do not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. Amen. Our lifeblood is in the word. There are two primary Greek words that are translated for word in the New Testament. The first one is logos, and the second one is rhema. The first one, logos, an example of that is in John 1.1, 1, 1, where it says, in the beginning was the word, the logos, and the word logos was with God, and the word was God, logos. In Revelation 12.1, it says, they defeated their enemy, Satan, by the blood of the Lamb and the word, the logos, of their testimony. What this is referring to is logos is the uttering of Christ himself. It is the spoken, communicated word through the scripture. The Bible is an example of the logos. However, the Greek word used in 4.4 that we just read to you, Jesus is speaking, people do not live have vitality, move, 
by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. They didn't use the word logos here in the scripture. They used the word rhema. What is he saying to us? Rhema is a right now word, a word from the Holy Spirit that gives you a sense of direction and joy and excitement of knowledge. Rhema word is a word for your current situation telling you what to do based on the logos. Makes it come alive. People do not live by bread alone but by every rhema spoken now word into your life that comes from the mouth of God. Timothy, my son, here are my instructions to you based on the prophetic words spoken to you earlier. May they help you fight the Lord's battles. We cannot afford in this hour to get discouraged with the assignment and the enormity of the assignment that God has set before us. Because if we get discouraged by what we see, we'll shrink back in fear and never take hold of the promise in our lives. But this is the hour to hold on to the rhema word, the spoken word of the Lord that says God is speaking and giving you words to help you take hold and, and accomplish all that he set for us to accomplish. Amen. That is why there is such a war against the prophetic. That is why it's so easy to despise it. That is why it's so easy to push it to the corner and say, that's not for me, that's for someone else. The moment you do that, you are not built up, you are pressed down, tamped down, held back, and stunted. We need to learn to lean in to the now words of God. We need to, to hear his kingdom strategies we know that we have been commissioned to go out and give the devil a bad day. We know that we've been commissioned to advance the kingdom. We know we've been commissioned to take the gospel into our neighborhoods, into the marketplace, into our families, to win souls, to share Christ. But what are you hanging on to? What's your now word? Don't let the enemy hijack your hookup. Don't let the enemy tell you it's not for you because it's for you. That you may all prophesy, that you may all speak, that instruction may come based on the prophetic words that you heard earlier, that you might fight well. Amen. Some of you are hanging on by just a thread because God told you your son will live and not die. He's in drugs, but you heard that God said he's going to be free. I hold on to that rhema word, even in spite of his failures over and over. Amen. God, I heard you. Some of you have sickness in your body and you heard the Lord say, you will live and not die. I hang on to that promise. And that gets me through the dark days. Helps me to fight well. Some of you, my, my dad is seeing the enormity of the project and so much obstacles and walls that have come up against so you can almost be like, I'm just done with it all. But I've heard the promises. Faith comes by hearing. It's not what I see. So he's raising up a company who embraces the word, the rhema word, not just the logos. This is a church that loves scripture. Every rhema has to be based upon the word of God. It's the plumb line. It's the scripture that God will never contradict scripture. So I take every spoken word and I put it up to the magnifying glass of scripture. And if it doesn't meet that criteria, boom, I kick it out and reject it. So not everything I hear is going to be from God. If I hear a thought come in my head, you can't do it, then I go back to the Logos and I say, wait a minute, Christ said I can do all things through him who gives me strength. I reject that word. But when Christ says you can overcome in this moment, I'm like, 
That's a rhema word for me right now. I go back to the scripture. Yes, he says I'm an overcomer in this life. Boom. Now let me fight with the good fight of faith. Now let me fight because I've heard the mandate of the Lord. I want you to stand with me as we close. Thank you for letting me crawl over just a little bit of our time. We took a little extra time showcasing the prophetic. So what am I supposed to do with this message? Two things the Holy Spirit told me. Some of us need to repent for how we've treated the prophetic, that it's for someone else and not me. Some of us need to repent because when a prophet comes into the house, we're like, ah, I don't want to be there. Some of us need to repent for pushing it and saying, oh, that's just people speaking flowery words when God has told us we're to encourage, edify, and exhort. Some of us need to repent for judgment. I want you to bow your heads and close your eyes and I'm asking the Holy Spirit's conviction to be upon us in this house. If you in your own heart, you know that you have not made room for the prophet, for the prophetic, for the gift. You know it because your own growth has been stunted because it's for the building up of the church, for you. But you haven't made room. Making room looks like, hey, there's a prophet coming in. I'm going to make room. I'm going to be there. I want to be in his midst or her midst. I want to be built up. I want to receive a now word. But if you have judgment in your heart against the gift or a, or a person who walks in the prophetic, Holy Spirit, convict us. Is there room in our lives? And if there hasn't been room, God, I just repent. Repent doesn't mean I'm supposed to booger cry and feel bad about it. Repent means to change the way I think. God, I see the value of this gift that we're pursuing. And I want to position myself to receive and to learn more and to experience more and to receive more impartation, not less. But I'm going to pause here. And if that's you, I just want you to say a simple prayer of a confession to the Lord asking for forgiveness. Father, forgive me for not making room for your now words that help me to fight in these hours. Forgive me for not making room for the prophet. So I haven't received the prophetic in my life. Forgive me for thinking that I know. Forgive me for being ignorant, which simply can mean to ignore. Forgive me for despising, which means mocking. If God is speaking to you, do business with him right now. Just say, God, forgive me. And I change the way I think. And there's going to be fruit from my repentance because I'm going to make room for the prophetic. I'm going to be in those meetings. I'm going to be uh, in these places where I get opportunities to grow. I want to be mentored in this gift even. There's even books I can give you that will begin to unpack it all for you. But I want to be used by God in this hour. Forgive us, O God. You have purposed 17 years ago, you said that this would be an eagle's nest. And as I faithfully pursued this, even with my ups and my downs, you have brought us to this place where there are literally 50, 60 people in this company of believers that have been trained in the prophetic and more to follow. I thank you for your purposes. That's the first part as we've done our repenting. The second part of this is you need to position yourself for the prophetic. And how you do that is a lot of people are like, oh, am I going to become weird? Am I going to lay hands on me? No. If you want to increase in the prophetic, you have to increase your prayer life. Because it's out of intimacy with God that he reveals his heart and his secrets to us. So I get alone with the Lord and I say, speak, and I learn to hear his voice. I'm supposed to pray over everybody in here for an upgrade in your prayer closet to receive the words of the Lord. Some of you, it's going to come in dreams. Some of you, it's going to come in visions. Some of you, it's going to be in the imagination or pictures that come into your mind. Some of you, it, it, the voice of the Lord is so awesome. We could have a whole message on that. 
but there's going to be an upgrade in your life to hear the word of the Lord. So I want everyone to not close your ears, but put your hands on your ears so you can still hear me. And the ears are just symbolic of the ears of your heart. God, you've called this church into a prayer movement. You've called this church into the place of strategy. You've called this church into the place to be positioned to hear your heartbeat. You've called this church to be ones who know the secrets of your heart and how you've wired us and created us to walk in this hour. You've called us to be people who know your voice. And so, Father, as hands are on people's ears right now, I pray upgrade. I even prophesy upgrade over you. That as you come into the secret place, you are going to be more revelatory than ever before because the spirit of revelation, the spirit of prophecy is going to come and rest upon you. And as you desire his heartbeat, the prophetic gift is going to be open to you in greater measures than ever before. And you don't even have to label yourself as prophetic or anything. Thing. You are just one who knows God's heart and speaks and calls out gold in all those around you. You are going to become an encourager. Where other people see, oh, my boss is a deadbeat. Look at all the things he or she is doing. Because of the spirit of prophecy that rests on you, you no longer see his or her brokenness. You see the treasure, and you are going to begin to call out the treasure. And that treasure, when you make room for that gift, all of a sudden there's going to be room for your gift, and you're going to be allowed to speak in that life, and you're going to find favor. See, there's a shift going on right now. There's a shift in the way you see. You only see the negative. You only see the brokenness even of this church. When you know the spirit of prophecy rests on you, it's not that you don't see the negative anymore. You're just so focused on the treasure that's there. It shifts. You're going to be an encourager. You're going to be an optimist. Not everything is breaking and falling apart, but everything is coming together because the Lord is speaking good things over us and through us. Let your ears be open. Let the heart of the encourager come forth. I ask this in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, Amen. 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 Have the prophetic edge.